Welcome back everyone to We Are Courageous, a series uh, for educators on American portrait. Uh, we are GPB Education. My name is Michael Kenlin. I'm an education outreach specialist with GPB and I'm joined by my colleagues Kim and Tracy and I'll pause for station identification there. Good afternoon everyone. I'm Tracy Wiley, Mike's counterpart and we are excited to be back our third week. Um, ready to discuss some exciting issues with you guys what, through American Portrait. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kimberly Mobley. I'm the Early Childhood Education Manager with GPB. Thank you so much for joining us. Welcome. Glad to be back with you all. Um, we are going to be covering a documentary series here and tools that we think teachers can use to utilize this in the classroom and ways that they can go about it. Um, a little bit of housekeeping. So this is our third in our series of five. We're posting um, the other two to YouTube in a playlist and we'll kick that out to you in our chat. That said, if you are here with us live in our Zoom uh, session, make sure that your drop down menu in the chat is uh, skewed to all panelists and attendees so that everyone can see you. We've got you guys muted, um, but if you want to raise your hand, we can unmute you so you can talk. There's gonna be a number of resources that are available like a toolkit, um, links to these videos, other resources. And so if you're here live with us on Zoom, we'll be emailing that out to you along with the recording, but you can always find this on YouTube. And for those of you who are joining us via Facebook, welcome. Really glad to have you. If you would do us the honor of just maybe letting us know where you are or an email address where we can follow back up with you, we would really appreciate it. Um, so let's get into what American Portrait is. So we're titling this We Are Courageous on the back of several series for professional development the PBS has done based on American Portrait. And this project is a documentary series, some of which has already come out, you may have seen, um, in this together about families. Um, my background, am I pointing the right way? Pointing the right way, there it is. Okay, uh, Self-Evident is a mini series they're spinning off with um, some PhD uh, educators uh, talking about Americans and their backgrounds. We're gonna focus on these submitted videos that will all come together as a documentary and that will air um, in the winter uh, after the new year. So this whole series is about us as Americans. We're facing some trying times. You may have noticed there's an election going on and we have a very big country. We're all very unique. We have different lives and jobs, origins and backgrounds. And so this is one way we can all come together um, in trying times. Here's a little ta uh, trailer to get you started. All right, standing by. Old spinning wheel. <laughs> This is my family. I'm gonna give you just a little snippet of my family. My grandpa and I would have this unspoken bond. I decided to document seeing my dad. We became a family. I have a biological family, but the family you choose love you unconditionally. Fantastic. So maybe a little hype video for you. We've shown two so far. That's our third one. And we've got a couple other trailers we're going to be showing in other episodes to kind of whet the appetite, as it were. Um, most of these sessions are based on uh, videos that have been submitted for this project. And those videos are based on prompts. And there's a number of different prompts that you can respond to. And we'll show you more about that. We've chosen several to coincide with some of the topics that we're going to cover. And I'm going to turn it over to the great Kim, and she's going to tell us more about how we do things. Thanks so much, Mike. 
American Portrait is indeed a compilation of videos from people all across America, and they're responding to over 20 prompts, as Mike has already forestated, from their personal lens. And so we recognize that it would be impossible to successfully share all of these prompts with you all. And so to this end, we've chosen five prompts. We've already discussed two prompts and today is our third and so um, we knew that we would not be able to do this in a in a grand way as we'd like to during this session and so we've already had the appetizer we've had our salad and today is the main course today we will discuss my greatest challenge and so you'll hear us refer to the the previous prompts that we've had very briefly throughout this session but today we're really going to focus on my greatest challenge and then you will hear us you'll hear us talk about next week's prompt week's prompt as well all right so for the agenda we will review the norms and expectations we will share and reflect again we'll look at what we've um, already done we'll talk about the prompt for today and then we'll start to reflect so that we can prepare for next week today's prompt my greatest challenge we want you to be thinking about that um, just as i'm speaking and as mike and you'll hear tracy begin to speak just be thinking about what are some of my greatest challenges or what is my greatest challenge we will share teaching materials and tools and all sorts of resources. Again, I'd like to reiterate, as Mike has stated, if you would please share with us your email address. There is an awesome teacher toolkit that we're going to share at the end of this session or before the end of the week. But we really want you to have access to that. And of course, we'll talk about next steps. All right, so someone is asking, why do we have to have norms for a Zoom session or for a webinar? I'm so glad you asked, because we believe that this is a fantastic way to model the very way that you might begin to have these conversations or implement the strategies that we will share in your very own classroom. Whether you're digital uh, learning or face-to-face, -face, norms are very, very important. Expectations are very important. And so we are going to model during this session what we believe might be very helpful as you begin to discuss. And so we ask that you would ask for clarifications. Um, when you ask for clarifications, this helps to avoid assumptions. And so if anything is said by myself, Mike, or Tracy um, during this session, or even by one of our audience members, we ask that you um, put it in the chat or that you raise that hand to ensure that you um, have clarification and there are no assumptions. We want to make sure that everyone's voice is heard, um, not just today, but throughout the remainder sessions. We want to make sure that everyone's voice is heard. We want to balance our participation, speak as well as listen, and you'll see us model that today. So we'll do some speaking and then we'll pause so that you might engage with us as well. We ask that we all listen actively without interruption, um, that we respect all of the opinions and thoughts of one another, and we share without judgment. And I always like to say that respect is the rule, and the rule is respect. And I've, I've always said that in my classes as well, and so you might want to share that with your students. All right. So here we are, we are ready for today to discuss. We can commit to listen more than we speak. I always like to say we have two ears, we have one mouth. And so we should be listening more than we speak. It helps us to gain understanding. It helps us to um, gain a sense of empathy and compassion for one another. And that is the environment that we want to be able to cultivate and facilitate for our students in our classrooms. And now back to you, Mike. Awesome, thank you, Kim. Um, our previous sessions were celebrate and then educate a little bit more on the expression, introduction, maybe getting to know one another. And now we start to get into discuss and next time confront, right? So a little bit different in terms of what a class may look like in these sessions. And so we chose my greatest challenge. So you may start to see students express things that may lead to disagreements now, right? So uh, discussions have opinions. We're not just expressing anymore. We may have those disagreements. And so we're going to talk about those kinds of disagreements and model some strategies that will help you um, structure your classroom discussions. And we are going to be seeing, as we do every session, 
two videos from American Portrait. We've chosen one from Georgia and then one from outside of Georgia. And you'll see near the end, um, also in your teacher toolkit, you can go to the American Portrait website and you can look through all of these prompts and you can choose uh, videos from all over the country and watch all sorts of videos. And of course, your kids can upload videos as well as you. Um, for these videos, we're going to model a very simple strategy each time, which is A-E-I-O-U. The first time we talked about an adjective to celebrate who we are or celebrate the stories of those we were watching. Then we moved on to educate each other about our emotions. So a little bit more about expression. You may not understand who I am or I may not understand who you are. And now we're going to dig into the discussion and think about what is interesting. So when you see these two videos, think about the challenges these people go through and something that you find interesting. Um, and as we talked about before, maybe as a teacher, you would just want it to be like a simple phrase or it could be a full sentence. That would be up to you as a teacher. But we're gonna ask you, uh, those of you who are here with us in the webinar, if you wouldn't mind thinking about your eye, what's interesting, and posting that in the chat box. Um, feel free to do that on Facebook as well. All right, those videos, our first one from Georgia, this one's fantastic. All right, standing by again. I think it wants you to choose. Oh, there we go. It does. <laughs> Your station. I'm picking these boxes up. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you for that. Here we go. My greatest challenge is knowing how to thank my neighbor, Mary Jo, for her selfless gift of a kidney for my son, Will. I just happened to be outside working in the yard the day that his mom came home from the testing and being at the hospital. She was out by her mailbox. And so I went over just to chit chat with her like we do when we're out in the yard. And I was the first one to find out that Will was sick. And at that time, Will had to start dialysis. And so we needed a living donor for his next transplant. She was a, a perfect match for Will. So all I did was go to sleep with two kidneys and I woke up with one. So I feel lucky because I got a kidney donated when there are 114,000 ki other kids waiting. I feel like I'm on top of the world when I think about that. And I just want kids like me to feel the same way as I do. Just to feel, to be happy, to be normal again. To be, to be a kid. Just to be happy and to play and uh, be with their friends, just to be like me now. Every day I wake up and, and how she saved him uh, and let him be a kid again. I get to look across the street every day and know that that kid's out walking his dog or getting on the bus and that I'm a part of that story. And that's amazing to me. Pretty powerful story. And you'll notice all these are just simple videos that have been submitted. They're all just, some of them are very short, just a couple minutes, um, some of them a little bit longer. And here is our non Georgia story. Being a black father in America is challenging because I have to raise my children in a world that may not always value them. I have to teach them about racism, I have to teach them how to advocate for themselves, I have to teach them how to navigate spaces and institutions where they may not always be welcome. I have to teach them their rights and what to do or not to do when they're pulled over by the police. I have to teach them how to be unapologetically Black and to love themselves. So maybe now we'll reflect a little bit, right, and we'll think about um, what we find interesting. Maybe as teachers you could have kids compare what they find interesting about the two videos. I just noticed this, right? So we've watched these a couple times. They're both outside on their porch. I never noticed that. That's interesting, which could spark a conversation. Now, that's obviously not where we're going with the deep discussion we're having, but sometimes just getting started is important. 
Um, and I'm going to bring Kim in on this as we're thinking about what's interesting and we're reflecting a little bit. Yeah, Mike and Tracy, I was looking at the fact that we're listening to the, the little boy, um, and even though he has a new kidney, I put in the chat, even though he has a new kid, kidney, he's still thinking about other kids. And I found that interesting and, um, and so great. And this might be an opportunity in your classrooms for um, even in that second video, should you use that video as an example to talk about my greatest challenge. Um, the, the young man in the second video broke down every single thing that he has to teach his children. And so it might be a discussion for you to be able to, well, to break your kids into different groups and have them to discuss. Some children may not even understand why does he have to teach that? Um, you know, why, why is that necessary for him to have to teach something as simple as how to navigate in the United States of America? And so that could be a discussion as well. Well, thanks, Nicole. Nicole says it's interesting that in both cases, the greatest challenge involved their children. Yeah, that's a great observation. Thanks so much, Nicole, for sharing. One thing I've noticed, Kim, is you know we did this the courageous conversations in July, and we went through some of these you know videos. And what really was interesting to me was um, this concept of neighborliness that you know the, the one um, story was about a neighbor who had come in and, and helped and this other gentleman's talking about you know how he's not recognized necessarily as a neighbor by by you know the people of his community and it made me think of the the video we showed from um it was from story Corps about ronald mcnair and how you know he was able to about social injustices and by him being able to go into the library and and you know those those bonds that were created by connections and being together you know forms neighborliness and so when we can can take away some of these social injustices these social barriers that bring us together physically and virtually um and develop become neighbors that you know we're more connected and understanding each other's plights and reaching out to each other yeah and that would bring i mean someone may even ask well, who's my neighbor is my neighbor just the person that lives next door uh, are you my neighbor because you are in my work community? Are you my neighbor because we are in the same environment? And so that's a lesson. I'm, I'm always thinking of ways to pull out lessons and make every single thing that we do within the classroom setting um, a teachable moment. And so that might be a, a time to discuss and reflect. It might be a challenge. These days we live in subdivisions, so it might be a challenge to even talk about neighbors outside of just your close knit, just where you live, your street. And so that could be a conversation as well we had so we've started just using this strategy we know it's a very simple strategy right so we start with adjectives emotions and then we get to something interesting um, and maybe I'm, I'm wondering what you all think about this so the adjectives and the emotions are sort of like meet and greets ways that we start to introduce ourselves get to know each other better when we were celebrating and educating um, here's what I think here's how I feel but now we get to something a little deeper, right? Because my greatest challenge may not be your greatest challenge, right? For instance, I noticed um, in the second video, that is not something that I deal with, right? As a white man, I do not have those kinds of issues. And so his life is not my life. And so we may start to see people disagree a little bit. Um, and I wonder if you had any tips on, as our students start discussing, they start disagreeing and how we can keep our structure and our norms in place as we get into these little bit more contentious conversations. Yeah, Mike, that's, that's very important to remind your students consistently of the norms and expectations. And as we talked about last week, um, norms are agreed upon. And so you, you, you develop these norms in your classroom together. And although during this session, we already had some of the most common norms already ready for you but it's a great idea to have the norms there's like there's a norm session where you develop them with your students you agree upon them and then you might even designate a norms keeper someone in your classroom depending on the age of your students to keep and ensure that everyone um, are that they're respecting the norms within the classroom but it's very important to do that at this time during discussion but you want to make sure that you acknowledge the opinions of the students in the classroom. So we wanna make it a safe space for students to speak, um, to share without judgment, to um, gain clarity and to act um, during, during your discussions in, in regards to my greatest challenge. 
And uh, this is something that we've talked about earlier too, just how teachers have mentioned that one of the hardest things for their kids seems to be expressing emotion. But if they feel safe and if you do this kind of uh, the mnemonic device over and over again and they're used to sharing their emotions is the second thing then maybe it'll be like you said Mike where it's more of a meet and greet so my emotions I feel safe expressing my emotions and so it's just part of the of the, the initial you know I see this and I feel this and they're they feel like they can do that from the beginning that's a goal I'm glad you mentioned that Tracy because I think um, oftentimes we start students to being able to express their emotions or share their emotions, um, maybe upper elementary, middle school. But I think it's important at the early education or the early learning stage to help children to understand their emotions, to be able to express those emotions safely and understand what they mean. So as they grow, they will feel more comfortable as well. And so as an early educator, you might want to um, have the smiley faces and show the smiley faces or um, faces that might not be so happy and and have them to feel comfortable that it's okay to have different emotions that they always aren't going going to be your happy emotions so that's important at the early stages as well that's great and I think as we're about to move on and show you some a little bit a little bit more structured um, ways of having these conversations I wanted to just put a little seed in there about I guess I keep bringing up um, how we can have a little bit of conflict in the classroom because I, I dealt with older students who some of them had preconceived notions and we started dealing with a lot of stereotypes. And so if we discussed um, you know, crime or poverty or debt, um, big issues, they would often reflect things they had heard that weren't necessarily true. And an easy statement on you know, old people are, young people are, poor people are, rich people are, would often trigger other students to get upset. And so I wonder maybe if before we go forward, you might think about, because those situations are likely to happen. And we, we definitely talked about our norms and expectations, but maybe a way to keep that from being a spark that derails some of this kind of teaching, because I definitely dealt with that a lot. I want to just keep going back to these strategies that we're sharing, because again, I think that when you start in a very structured way, like well, A-E-I-O-U, that's all we're going to share right now is just the adjective and a phrase about the adjective. We're not going to have a debate about this. You know, we're not going to go into more depth. This is all we're going to do for now. Or with the thinking hats. You know, if my thinking hat from last week is the facts, I'm only expressing the facts. I might feel a ton of stuff, but it's not coming out because I don't have the feeling hat on my head this week. I have the fact hat. The feeling hat is going to come from that group and I am not allowed to debate with them and yell at them that they're feeling incorrectly. So I, again, like this is sort of a, a, you know, a pairing of the norms and these very, very structured strategies. And then once the kids kind of get it out of their system, maybe it'll tone down a little bit for some open discussion. That's fantastic, Tracy. Yeah. And I will uh, turn, Kim, do you have one more thing to add? No, no, no. Again, I was just going to say that's an excellent point, Tracy. Your behavior management, classroom management skills are going to be key at this point. But having that structured time is very, very important to get them to focus on, sometimes just to focus on just the facts. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, I'm going to put the thinking hats. I love the thinking hats. I never used to look at it all that much, Tracy, and now I'm looking at it all the time. I'm gonna put that in our chat and we'll send that over to Facebook. But you can find that in our teacher toolkit, which we'll go over in just a bit. Tracy, it's all you. Yes, thank you guys. So at this part of our presentation, we've shared with you videos from American Portrait. And these are videos that are not professionally done. It's just some person in the, on their front porch, you know, taping themselves. And then together, these videos become a program. That's the beauty of American Portrait. But some of the other PBS programming is similar in that PBS hosts go out into the community and interview people and get their, their fresh expressions, just like we've been getting from American Portrait. So this is a, a program similar to that. You may be familiar with it. It's called America from Scratch. And our host goes into the streets of America and he asks these questions you know, around the most important issues of the day, and he starts these discussions. And so they can be contentious areas of discussion, but he just tries to get like a whole big picture. Again, as we've talked about young and old and rich and poor and all kinds of backgrounds, gets all sort of the big picture of what we're all feeling and kind of puts it together and starts to work things out. So we wanted to show you a little bit about this series. 
You can find all of the content that we uh, highlight during this section of our, of our sessions every week on PBS Learning Media. So here we are at PBS Learning Media. You can see it in the corner. To get to this website, you would just go to gpb.pbslearningmedia.org and then you'll have um, this whole resource of thousands and thousands of pieces of content, most of, much of it about social and emotional learning, about current events, about social studies and civics like we are doing today. And this one series, America from Scratch, which you can find by typing America from Scratch, it'll pop up. You'll see that there are 11 videos that are available here on PBS. You can also get them on YouTube. And the question is again, what if we made America from scratch today rather than 250 years ago? I just love the whole premise of this show. What if we just started all over? What would it look like? What would we change? What would we do? And so again, he's not going out into the streets with an agenda, with a, a, a opinion. He's asking people, do you think 12 year olds should be allowed to vote? Why or why not? Do you think we should even have a president? I mean, let's talk about this. Things that we may not necessarily ask ourselves. What if we didn't have any states? What would the United States look like without states? Should we rewrite our constitution? This is coming up a lot. All these things are coming up in the news a lot right now. Should the US require half its government to be female? Every single one of these, I'm like, oh yeah, we just, I just heard that on the news. Should Facebook sell your data? Should Supreme Court justices be elected? I mean, this is like, this is every moment that we're hearing on, the, on current events. So all of these great discussion videos. So the one that we chose to just highlight today, because we felt it kind of went with some of the videos we were talking about, and we're going to get to that in a minute, but we like at this part also to give you another strategy. So um, we've been doing AEIOU for the American Portrait videos. Every week we do a different A, E, I, O, or U. Last week we did five thinking hats, just referred to that. This week we are doing the snowball discussion. So this is another way that you can scaffold uh, instruction and discussions in your classroom. And the idea with this is that you present a question or an idea and you just pair two students and say the two of you talk about it. And you know when two people are talking, it can be pretty friendly. It's pretty, you know, low key. You know, two people, they're not, you know, trying to impress their followers on Facebook or anything. They're just talking. And then once they kind of get that out and sort of like, oh, I never thought of that. And that's an interesting perspective and kind of get that out. Then those two people join another pair and it makes four, right? So now you got four people and they've each already discussed and come to some nice consensus. Now they're gonna bring that consensus to the foursome and then they're gonna join another foursome and make eight. And so it's kind of an, a way to ease into these difficult conversations because they, be, they become unified or sort of, you know, un, they start to understand each other in the small groups and then it grows and grows into a classroom. And the idea is hopefully by that point, you'll have a more unified, more um, understanding view that's reached the classroom because it's gone two by two by two, just like Noah's Ark. Okay, so that's kind of the idea. We're gonna start with here with snowball discussion and we're going to share a video. And this one I just, we thought would be cute because it is, should 12 year olds be allowed to vote? We just saw this wonderful video of a young person who received a kidney and says, now I can just be a kid and I'm so grateful that I can be a kid. But at the same time, you know, he's got ideas and thoughts and what he wants to be when he grows up, he has opinions. And then we taught, we met this other gentleman who is underrepresented, feels underrepresented. So children are underrepresented. Many times our African American neighbors are underrepresented. Who do we allow to vote and how, you know, how do we make those decisions? So this is a great video about whether or not 12 year olds should vote. And I'm actually going to play, it's a bit long, it's eight minutes. But um, if Mike and Kim, if, if we have the time, I'd like to play half of it. So I'd like to play about three minutes from the beginning and a minute of the end, if that's okay. All right, great video. I recommend you watch the whole thing, but I'm just gonna pick the beginning and end. Do you think 12 year olds should be allowed to vote? Absolutely not. <laughs> 12 year olds should not yet be allowed to vote. Generally, 12-year-olds are easierly manipulated. 12 might be a little young, but they're probably smarter than I am. <laughs> if they pass a test, I don't know. <laughs> okay, can we scratch that? I do believe young people really have an interest in politics and they deserve to be happy. If they are allowed to vote, what are they allowed to vote on? Maybe 16, maybe. I could see that as a possibility. Okay. <laughs> I'm Tucson Morrison, a writer, actor, and musician living in Minnesota. 
And in 1776, when the United States was founded, it would have been illegal for me to vote. In fact, the only people who could vote were white males who owned land. And those white males could not be Jewish, Catholic, or Quaker, because all those religions were barred as well. Thankfully, this is not the case today. And that's because, as most of you know, over the past 240 plus years, access to the polls has been slowly but steadily expanding. For example, by 1830, property ownership and religious restrictions were largely eliminated. In 1868, the 14th Amendment, at least on paper, gave African-American men the right to vote, although many states spent years denying this right. 1920, the 19th Amendment made it legal for women to vote. And in 1971, the 26th Amendment granted 18-year-olds the right to vote. These are just a few landmark examples. Overall, the trend in this country is moving towards greater inclusion and access. You can even visualize this increase by graphing the percentage of the total population that's voted in presidential elections since the nation's founding. And when you look at this chart, it's interesting to think about where this trajectory may take us in the future. For example, if we were to build America from scratch today, would we, as we asked earlier, let 12-year-olds vote? I don't think that 12-year-olds should be allowed to vote. Sounds like a silly question, but remember, Back in 1776, it sounded silly to let someone like myself, who wasn't a white male that owned land, be able to vote. Oh, you're going to a place I didn't go. It turns out that right here in Minnesota, one of the state's longest serving former lawmakers, State Representative Phyllis Kahn, spent several decades trying to expand voting rights to young people. Here she is in 1989, making her case that 12 year olds should vote. Representative Kahn, you chair a division of the uh, House Appropriations Committee degrees from Harvard and Yale, and I think some people might say this can't be a serious proposal. Well, it certainly is a serious proposal, Eric. It, I came to it from listening to the proposals for a children's agenda and a children's plan, and I realized that there was one missing plank in all those platforms, and that's the empowerment of children to help set their own agenda. I think history has shown us that when a segment of society is denied the right to vote, the rights, all the rights of that segment of society, are then inferior. All right, I'm just going to pause there and jump ahead. It's a lot to take in right there, of course. Um, and I, again, I would definitely recommend go watch the, the, the middle as well. But I want to skip to the end just so we don't spend the whole time um, watching this. This is great. Yeah. Some people could vote. And is it a country we'd want to live in? Last thing, raise your hand if you think schools would look different if you all were able to vote right now. And there you have it. Everybody has an opinion. What do you think? Do you think this trend will continue towards greater access? Or do you think letting young people vote is a bad idea? Share your thoughts and please do subscribe. Tucson Morrison. This is America from scratch. Thanks for joining us. So I actually cut it a little bit uh, farther than I wanted to, but the idea was, um, you know, the children have a also have an opinion on how schools and society should should work. And so I love the way they all raised their hand at the end if they thought school would be different if they had a chance to vote uh, unanimous. So I'm going to pause there and see. Um, we can't really do a snowball discussion uh, together. This was more of a tool that we wanted to talk about, but we certainly can. Um, two, one, one to four, or two. There's three of us, so we can start with three. And of course, more people can join in. We can snowball from there. So I'm going to pause and just see if there are any thoughts on that that video. That video was awesome. Can you imagine having just that very last question, Tracy, as a snowball uh, discussion in the classroom? If schools, if we got the input of students <laughs> um, in, in terms of designing curriculum and schools, oh, they probably would have a blast with that discussion. Um, I think this learning strategy is awesome in terms of allowing students to express their opinions, but also teaching them how to debate and how to debate in a safe space and be okay with disagreeing with other people. It's okay that you have your own opinion and again, when we talked about at the beginning, learning to listen more than we speak, right? And so, I'm sorry, that's my dog. That's an awesome opportunity to teach students to learn to listen more than they speak.
Yeah, I love that you just said that, Kim. That's such a great idea for starting it really safe. You know, if you could, if you could change anything in the school, what would it be? And this is my vote. And of course, I, mean, I didn't mention the sort of obvious is that we're all voting. We're all in the voting situation right now. And we're talking about votes and who gets to vote. Um, and so I love the way we, Mike and I have gotten lots of requests from teachers about how do we have these discussions about voting? You know, how do we have mock elections in our classroom? And this is a great way to start it, right? With just, okay, let's, let's just talk about voting in general and, and let's vote on something important to us, but that's not necessarily on the national agenda and then go from there and build up. That's great. I'll offer what everyone else is thinking, but not saying probably is that somebody's going to say, absolutely not. Right. Um, but I think what everyone's thinking is, yeah, we shouldn't have uh, 12 year olds voting on tax policy or war, right? What they're sort of skirting, or at least maybe in the middle of the video that we didn't get to see, is that what they're really talking about is voting on the things that are closest to them and that matter most to them, right? Um, and that makes a lot more sense, right? If you ask kids to vote on what they get served in the cafeteria, wow, you may actually find out that they eat more in the cafeteria and then you're not wasting so much food and energy and electricity and all sorts of stuff like that just because you gave them a shot at uh, having their own voice heard. Absolutely, Mike. I think we have a hand raise from Teresa. Awesome. I think we opened Teresa's mic. It looks like she has dropped off. So a lot of times we're trying to figure this out, right? Which button to push when? And so hopefully she'll come back as a participant and jump in with her thought. Um, yep, she's, she's dropped off. We, we moved her to panelists to try oh. to allow her to talk. Um, and her mm -hmm. mic, uh, if you look at panelists. She is a panelist now, but I cannot unmute her mic. Can someone else possibly unmute her mic? I have tried. It could have just been a, um, like I said, an accidental button push. Hello? Can you? Yes. Hey, hello. <laughs> Sorry about that. Actually, I didn't realize that I raised my hand, <laughs> but, um, but anyways, um, since I've uh, got your attention, I guess, uh, but I just really like the idea of the snowball um, discussion. And so I really think that that is uh, an excellent strategy to help kind of um, get a discussion going without, you know, opening it up to everyone right at the beginning, because some would definitely feel intimidated to, to um, speak about their feelings. So... Um, so that's all I had to say. Thank you. Thank you. So glad you're back. We remember you from Courageous Conversations. So welcome back. And I just want to say, don't if you're a teacher in the classroom and you try the snowball um, strategy, don't be afraid of the noise. As a former administrator, a lot of times teachers would think, oh my goodness, if the students are making a lot of noise, then that might not be a good thing. And so the more they join other groups, the louder your classroom is going to get. And that's okay, as long as it's what I like to call structured uh, positive noise, right? So it's going to be okay to have that snowball strategy. And it's okay if they're all talking at one time because soon your group will get larger and it's going to be one whole group discussion. And that's what you want. So encourage that. That's great. The, um, oh, I had one, one thought here. Um, I think it was at the last uh, Georgia Council GCSS um, conference. Tracy, you and I presented some really um, interesting progressive sessions on like uh, uh, civ civic engagement and social justice, I think is what we did maybe. And I yeah, remember- I did it on this, this topic as well. I think it was the 16 year olds, can they vote? There it is, <laughs> perfect. All right, I'm right. Yeah, I'm lucky on that one. Um, and one thing we talked about was uh, if you're going to bring kids into these discussions, maybe consider starting with something that's lower stakes. So I brought up something like um, uh, something that everyone will have an opinion on, but doesn't really matter all that much. Like uh, something that comes to mind is I was in the grocery store earlier and I saw someone buying an Almond Joy bar and I think they're gross. 
uh, and, and I'm a mounds guy, right? Which like total low stakes there, but you can essentially flesh out the conversation and model the conversation you're going to have with a question that is very low stakes and slowly increase the stakes, which I think you've kind of done here. Like will 12 year olds get to vote unlikely, but you can still have the discussion and show what more contentious discussions would look like. Absolutely, it's also a good um, icebreaker, right? So we're still getting to know each other. It's still relatively early in the school year, so it's great for an icebreaker, like you said, Mike. If you just debate over favorite foods or favorite pets, or um, you know, maybe not favorite sports teams, but you know something. And I did want to again uh, mention this. This keeps coming up about uh, twelve-year-olds, even though it seems like a silly question. If you watch the middle of the video, it's it's not so silly. It does talk about you know the arguments to get letting against letting twelve-year-olds vote are the same arguments that were used against letting women vote and, let get, and let, letting black people vote. You know, that for instance, women would vote just like their husbands and the argument is children would vote just like their parents. Um, you know, or that women can be easily ma manipulated by their husbands and children can be easily manipulated by their friends. And, and she threw out this idea that, you know, a lot of 12 year olds are not gonna know how to vote, but a lot of 20 year olds don't know how to vote. A lot of 30 year olds don't know how to vote. A lot of 80 year olds don't know how to vote. So that argument itself, you know, is, is kind of uh, qualitative. So yes, thank you guys um, for your discussions. And if there's nothing else, I'm gonna send it on to you, Mike, and you're gonna talk about how people can actually share their opinions here with American Portrait. That's great, thanks, Tracy. So just to recap, so you have one, one uh, strategy that's a thread running throughout. Um, and then we've shown three different strategies. If you go back and check out our playlist, we've got two from the previous, one this time that hopefully should help your students get, a, get to express themselves um, safely and now start to structure some of these discussions that are a little bit more difficult to have, these courageous conversations. What's really wonderful is you can get involved. So you as a teacher, you can submit, parents can submit, students can submit, and some classes have made it a project where they will choose prompts and they will submit, and then they'll essentially provide a rationale for why they did and how they went about it. And um, we're going to help you with that a little bit here. So we're really fortunate as a production company um, to have some folks who have helped us talk about uh, some tips for putting together videos with kids. So in our previous two sessions, uh, we did the same thing, uh, thinking about how we eat an elephant, right? A video is a big production. So we talked about brainstorming in the beginning and some tips on choosing your prompt, just thinking about which prompt you might like, and then how you would uh, portray that prompt. What kind of tone would you take, right? For you ELA teachers out there, right? Tone is a powerful thing in writing. Um, and as you move into a choice, then you're going to want to begin to structure some things. So we discussed how would you narrate? What kinds of words would you use? Words are powerful. Um, but also what images would go with what words? And you may have started to notice that the, these videos that we just showed you, the, the first two, um, one was the gentleman just sitting on his porch talking directly, very, very seriously, whereas the child was swinging. Um, you guys pointed that out to me the other day. And they also switched between three different people, which totally changes the tone of the uh, video. And so we're going to move into our next tip. And you can find all this in our teacher toolkit. We'll show you a little bit more about that um, at the end. But we're gonna move into design. So let's say that you know your prompt, you, you understand the tone it's gonna strike, and then you've written most of your script, you know the words you want to use, how long you're gonna talk, what things you wanna show. But now you really want to structure what folks are gonna see, what, right, uh, what, who's your audience. Um, and we're gonna think about our, our prompt from next time. So we move from my greatest challenge, maybe even a little bit deeper to you don't know what it's like. Really, you haven't been where I've been, you haven't seen what I've seen. And when you're designing, you might want to think about everything else. The sounds in the background. Notice uh, the shirt the gentleman was wearing, right? That brings up interesting points between what he was saying and what it says. That there is just a simple discussion. Um, will you wear a hat? Will there be a prop, right? All sorts of stuff. The cinematography, shot low, shot high. What other things will you show? So you've, you've thought about it, you've scripted it, and now you're gonna consider storyboarding it. Is there an arc? Is there a beginning, middle, and, or an end, right? So all of these things, and it's all written in our teacher toolkit. So for next time, be considering what elements you would add or what elements you might take away. And all of those prompts 
are available on the American Portrait site, which is just a huge repository of, I think, if I remember correctly, I think they've now hit the 10,000 mark. So there's over 10,000 videos here, all broken down by the prompts. And you can just look at each prompt and click on a video, which is in itself just a fun way. Uh, you know, you think about getting stuck in a YouTube rabbit hole, this is a great rabbit hole you can go down just clicking on all sorts of different videos and they'll tell you where these folks are from. You can have your students pick out different ones and compare them and run some of these uh, strategies that we're talking about. Um, but you can submit and uh, we're gonna give you some uh, directions on how you can submit these videos with your students. And we have a little promo to help you and then we'll go over this. Now, if that seemed like a little much, there are a few steps. I still really like the video, um, and we've got that in your teacher toolkit, so you can show that to your students. I know sometimes with us casting, it's a little scratchy, um, and if that was a little much, it's okay, because we put together a list of steps in your teacher toolkit, and we drop that in the chat box. We also put it um, on, uh, here, Tracy, are we missing that? I can send it over to you real quick. Yeah, we are. That's okay. Um, here's the link. I'll just send it over to you and you can open that up. So it's in uh, the YouTube description. It is also, um, it will it come in a follow-up email and it's in all your chat boxes, Facebook and um, in the chat box here on Zoom. Okay, so it's an open Google Doc for you and it's going to show some basics, right? Just an introduction to the series that we've kind of gone over here. And then um, what you need to know, right? So like, remember you are going to submit a piece of media that could be used. So a little bit on privacy and stuff like that. Then the cheat sheet, right? So if that video is too much, here's just five simple steps and all the links you'll need to submit with your students. Um, and then we go over some of our structure, right? So we've got the major descriptions to all of our sessions. So you can kind of think about how we ate the elephant and how you can do it too. Additionally, all of our steps for producing. So if you want to do a little bit of media literacy in the classroom, plus some graphics, right, on scripting. Also, my fantastic storyboarding uh, drawings there, right? Um, and then a little bit more on the arc of a story, right? So it's all there for you. And then uh, finally, all the links we are using. So stuff maybe that we haven't seen. So there's like the homepage, PBS Learning Media, and then um, some background stuff. I really like some of the KQED stuff. Um, the Miles video is great to show your kids how to take better video. That one's fantastic. Um, all the collections that Tracy is showing, those are all listed. And uh, you can check all those out with all the other videos that are available, plus, Da, 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 da. every single teaching strategy that we are showing is listed per episode. So you can go back and check them out. They usually come from folks like Harvard or other universities, their education departments. And they have a lot of great graphics, printables and stuff like that. So all that stuff is in there for you. That document, you can just make a copy of you if you want. Um, you can turn it into a PDF, but it's all yours. Um, you all have full access to it. Awesome, thank you, Tracy. I guess that takes us to the end. And I really enjoyed this session. I wanna thank everybody for coming, remind you 
that you can follow us on Twitter and Facebook at GPB Education. You can email us at our education desk, education at gpb.org. Um, next week is you don't know what it's like and we'll get into confront. So the discussion gets deeper. We have more strategies on having these kinds of courageous conversations. Tracy, Kim, thanks a lot for being here. Always a pleasure. We always learn something new every week. And uh, even though we're saying goodbye, feel free to jump in if anyone has any last thoughts out there in Facebook land or in Zoom who'd like to uh, throw out some last thoughts as well. Happy, to, always happy to hear them. Yeah, thanks again for joining us. As usual, I had a blast with you all, Mike and Tracy, and the audience that's joined us live on Facebook as well as Nicole and Teresa um, right here on Zoom. So thank you all so much. Look forward to next week. And um, see you then. Two more sessions, both of them uh, Thursdays at four. Uh, please feel free to come back. Um, we'll post this on YouTube and then there'll be a whole series and a playlist and you can watch it as much as you want and go through all these strategies. Thank you all for coming. We really appreciate it.